Hello everyone, I hope you're all having a wonderful Sunday, and if not, this game will surely improve it. Uh, this is a, an epic game from the Soviet Championship, played in 1954 in Kiev in Ukraine, and here we have the no reverse uh, gear Rashid Gibiatovich Nezhmedinov versus the Iron Tiger, Tigran Vartanovich Petrosian, the future world champion. And uh, it's uh, this is such a delight, you know, truly a, a feast for the mind, as there are probably no two styles that are more opposite than the one of Rashid Nezhmedinov and Tigran Petrosian. So let's let's see this game. Uh, Rashid opens up the game with e4. We have c5, knight to f3, d6 and d4. We have c captures, knight captures and knight to f6. Knight to c3 and a6 by Petrosian. So he goes for the knight of, knight of variation of the Sicilian. Uh, bishop to g5, knight b to d7, and now we have this queen to f3 move. And uh, Petrosian immediately goes for h6. Now, this is this is a move that's uh, useful in a lot of ways, and it's not a move that an attacker like uh, Rashid Najmedinov wants to, wants to face. As now you have to decide, uh, do you go bishop b3, do you capture, do you go bishop to h4? Uh, the problem with the move like bishop to h4 uh, let's say after something like queen to c7, you, you never really have a chance to play queen to g3, and queen to g3 is a move that uh, every attacker loves to play, uh, <clears throat> because now that the queen comes in g3, there's always this g5 move, and you've taken away the g3 square for the bishop to retreat. Uh, so, after this h6 move, uh, of course Nezhmedinov doesn't want to give up the bishop pair, so bishop to e3. Uh, we have e5 now, uh, knight to f5, and g6. Knight to g3, and here we have b5. Another interesting move uh, would be to play h5 here, but uh, there's a reason Petrosian doesn't go for h5, uh, because this allows bishop to c4, and after b5 and bishop to b3, uh, black is perfectly fine here, but you don't want to give Rashid Nezhmedinov any open lines. So instead, after knight to g3, he plays bishop uh, b5, not allowing this bishop to be, to be developed on c4, as he knows this is exactly what Rashid wants. So h4, and uh, we have h5, stopping any opening of the position by Rashid. Uh, bishop back to g5, and now bishop to e7. Here, queenside castle by Nezhmedinov, bishop to b7, and uh, king to b1. Uh, rook to c8, castling is also fine in this position, but uh, Petrosian wants to leave his options open. He's gonna go rook to c8, now he will try and create some pressure on the queen side, maybe with a5, uh, b4. Uh, also, he's planning to play knight to c5 uh, to create a lot of pressure on this e4 pawn. Uh, so, uh, not castling immediately, he likes to leave his options open, and we have bishop to d3 now. And you can see that uh, already, this isn't a kind of position that Nezhmedino would enjoy. The entire position is closed, uh, he doesn't have any open lines, so uh, he, has to, he has to play what he can. Knight to c5 now, uh, we have knight to e2, now Rashid is preparing bishop to g4 <clears throat> after he captures the knight on f6, and we have b4 here. And uh, here you can't move the knight, if you move the knight then this... Uh, this e4 pawn is weak as it's attacked three times. So here, first bishop captures on f6. Bishop captures and now knight to d5. Uh, bishop captures, pawn captures, and here we have queen to e7. Uh, an interesting move again, why doesn't uh, Petrosian capture on h4? Uh, if you capture on h4, this is perfectly fine for black. Uh, but again, this allows g4, and uh, Petrosian doesn't want to allow Rashid any open lines, so, you know, he wants to keep the position closed and positional. Uh, so let's say queen to f6 here, after queen h3, h captures on g6, queen captures on g6, and still, black is fine here, but now Rashid does have some pressure, the rook is attacked on c8, no reason to go into this. So after this e captures on d5, uh, Petrosian plays the very simple queen to e7. Now threatening pawn to e4, winning a piece. Uh, this forces Rashid to play knight to g3, and only now does Petrosian capture on h4, bishop captures, because now uh, the knight is preventing the pawn on g2 to, to be pushed forward. Uh, we have knight back to e4, again Rashid is preparing this g4 move, he wants to open up those lines, uh, but bishop to g5, again preventing g4. Uh, if you push g4 now, then h4, and now Petrosian has a very strong pass pawn here. So, after bishop to g5, g3 is played, uh, Rashid doesn't allow Petrosian to push that pawn any further, and we have a5 here. Uh, rook d to e1, 
Uh, knight captures on e4, bishop captures on e4, and now f5. Bishop back to d3, and uh, here bishop to f6. Uh, of course, you don't want to push uh, e4 here. It does seem like you're pinning something, but this actually loses because bishop can simply capture the pawn. Uh, f cap, uh, so <laughs> sorry, uh, f captures on e4 and rook captures, you lose the queen. Uh, so, after this bishop to d3 move, bishop to f6, uh, and we have bishop to b5 check. King to f7, and uh, this is move 26, and Petrosian still ha hasn't castled. He waited to see what Rashid will do, and now he finds a uh, sanctuary for his king uh, on the f7 square, where the king will be very safe. Uh, queen to b3, and king to g7, getting the king out of this... Uh, Diagonal, you know, it's it's he's gonna be much safer here, and it's not like uh, Rashid has any forcing move here to do. Uh, we have f3, not allowing this e4 push, and now h4, uh, g4, f captures, f captures, and now bishop back to g5. Again, keeping everything closed. Uh, bishop back to d3, and here we have h3. Uh, bishop to a6, attacking Petrosian's rook. And uh, here you have a couple of options, uh, you can go rook to a8, you can move the rook somewhere else, but it's better to move it to a8 as this comes with a tempo on the bishop. So uh, rook to a8, attacking the bishop on a6, and here comes uh, a very nice Nezhmedino move. Uh, rook captures on h3. Now what's the idea behind rook captures on h3? This is, uh, this is quite crazy, I mean if rook captures, queen captures, uh, Rook captures bishop, it seems like Petrosian is clearly winning a piece here. Uh, but is he really? That's the question. So let's check it out. Uh, if, uh, sorry, uh, if rook captures on h3, then queen captures on h3. Rook captures on a6, and what is uh, Rashid's idea here? Uh, rook to h1. So what now? You have to play queen to e8, and this is a move you have to find. If you play moves other than queen to e8, then white can do some serious damage. So queen to e8, and after queen to h7 check, king to f6, now comes rook to f1 check, uh, you have to block with the bishop on f4, and again, after queen to h4 check, you have to play king back to g7, and now after rook to h1 again, uh, now uh, now uh, Rashid would be threatening b uh, queen h7 back to h4, uh, creating a perpetual, uh, and this is the move you will have to find, queen to f8. And now after queen to h7 and king to f6, uh, queen to h4, now comes king to f7, and after queen to h7 again, uh, you still have to be very careful, it's uh, quite a poisonous position, if you play something like king e8, then queen to b7 wins a rook, the rook has nowhere to go. Uh, so, after this king to e8 move, uh, sorry, after this queen to h7 check, you have to block with queen to g7, and now uh, black has refuted white's attack, and he's definitely up a piece and winning this game. Uh, but from this rook to captures an h3 move, you have to see 10 moves ahead, and those 10 moves have to be uh, surgically precise. So uh, it's not like uh, this variation was uh, out of Petrosian's reach to calculate, but he, uh, he's playing against Rashid Nezhmedinov, and he doesn't want to allow him this. Uh, he finds another move that, uh, that simplifies the position, which is totally in his style, and he plays bishop to h4. Uh, now, Nezhmetino's bishop is attacked on a6, uh, his rook is attacked on e1, and he has to he has to play rook, uh, rook to h1. If he moves the bishop, he loses the rook, so nothing to do here really. Rook e to h1, uh, and here rook captures on a6 is played. Now, it seems like uh, uh, Petrosian won a piece, but it's not all that clear. Uh, there is only one move in the position that uh, Nezhmetino finds, and that is g5. Now you're blocking the queen's uh, protection uh, of the bishop on h4, also if you capture with the bishop, then you lose the rook on h8. So only move is queen captures on g5, and now Nezhmetinov plays bishop to c uh, queen to c4. Uh, this comes with a triple attack on the bishop on h4, and also it, it attacks the rook on a6. So rook to a7, you have to move the rook, and now comes rook captures. Rook captures. And now uh, Petrosian is attacking Nezhmetinov's queen on c4 and also the rook on h1. Uh, here you have to you have to capture the rook, otherwise you're going to be down a whole rook. So queen captures, queen captures, and the rook captures. And uh, after the storm settled down, uh, you can see that uh, Petrosian is up one pawn. 
Uh, but it's a rook ending, you know, he's up one pawn, there's a, there's the old saying that uh, all rook end games are drawn, even if uh, one, one player is a pawn up. Uh, but here you have another very important thing, it's uh, the principle of two weaknesses. Uh, if you can see here, uh, black has this very strong passed G pawn. And uh, here white, white's king is so far away, uh, white, white, white needs like five moves to get his king into the game. And uh, the other weakness is the weak d5 pawn. There is no way for white to protect this d5 pawn. Uh, I mean, he can protect it with a rook h1 to rook to d1, but then there's no stopping the g pawn. So here, rook to c7 was played. This Petrosian would find this move like, well, in his sleep, uh, going for rook to c5, winning the d5 pawn. Uh, rook to h1, we have g g5 now, uh, king to c1, and here you see the problem. Uh, uh, Nezhmetinov can't really bring the king in. If he brings the king in, then simply rook c5 and the, the pawn is won. And if you play rook here, then you block the king from from coming into the game. So uh, those are some unsolvable problems for white, unfortunately. Rook to c5 by Petrosian, now rook to d1, and now simply king g6, bringing the king into the game to support the pass g pawn to promotion. Uh, rook to d2, hoping to bring the king into the game, uh, but g4 is coming, king d1, and now king f5, and uh, it was in this position that Rashid Gabatovich Nezhmedinov resigned the game. Uh, why did he resign? Well, uh, you can't uh, prevent both threats. Uh, rook has to move with check, uh, now you have to go behind the pass pawn, now black can simply win the d5 pawn, and uh, after a couple of more moves, let's say rook g6 going after the pawn, but after rook d2, uh, yes, you will win uh, the g4 pawn, but now black wins all of these pawns on the queen side, and that's simply too much to take. So after this king f5 move, uh, Rashid resigned the game, and a great victory for uh, Tigran Vartanovich Petrosian, future world champion. Now, uh, I do hope you enjoyed this game, as uh, Rashid really tried to open those lines uh, for the entire game, and uh, it's interesting that Petrosian didn't always play the strongest move, but he played the, the move that, uh, that he knew that would bother uh, Nezhmedinov uh, the most. So, not, he even didn't uh, grab a piece immediately when Rashid offered it, uh, even though he could. But, you know, he played a calm move, and he knew that, that that's the way to play against uh, the no-reverse gear Rashid. Now, uh, this game was played, like I said, in 1954. That's nine years uh, before Petrosian won his World Chess Championship title against Mikhail Botvinnik. That match was in 1963. Uh, but you can see, even in, even in his younger days, he was quite a, quite a capable player and uh, probably one of the few that could actually stop uh, Nezhmetinov's attacks. And the one other thing I wanted to show you, uh, this is the tournament table, uh, the final standings after the tournament. Uh, you can see that Petrosian won only 5th place in this tournament, Rashid won 7th place. And uh, here you have Yuri Averbach in 1st place with 14 and a half points. So that's, you know, for, for a Soviet championship with all of these Russian legends, that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, Yuri Averbach is still alive today, he's 95 years old and I believe he's the oldest living grandmaster. So, very nice Mr. Yuri. Uh, in 2nd place you have Mark Taimanov, 3rd place Viktor Korchnoi. Uh, here you have Georgi Lisitsin, uh, Georgi Mihailovich Lisitsin, I have uh, a book of his, uh, it's a book called uh, Strategy and Tactics in Chess, it's in three parts and it took me, uh, I went through this book some 10 years ago, it took me uh, a year and a half to finish all three parts as you do have a lot of positions to solve and uh, the third book is about finding a game plan so it's an excellent book, I, I really recommend it to everyone if you have a chance, uh, do, do get it as uh, my tactics really improved and you really get a lot of a lot of attacking ideas and a lot of planning ideas after finishing the game f finishing the books and here like i said petrosan in fifth place you have kolmo veratimir in sixth and uh, some other very famous russian names like Svetin alexei here here you have effing geller uh, flor salo uh, andro lilienthal look at him all the way back so we can imagine what a strong tournament this was so yeah uh like I said, I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Ignatius Fernandez, uh, George Fafard, and Ronan Sinman for a contribution to my channel, and also Dr. Becco for a contribution in Bitcoin. Thank you a lot, I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Uh, thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. And uh, hope this game 
improve your Sunday. See you soon.